emphasis on that. So I'm going to stick to the early modernist period for right now, 1901 to 1939. Why 1901? That's when Queen Victoria died. So she was the longest reigning monarch for a very long time. Uh, I think the current Queen Elizabeth is now the longest reigning monarch just by a couple of years. But you can imagine, let's put a pin in everything else that was going on in the world, but she'd been the monarch since your grandmother, you know, was around. It was a, a shock to the country. They felt like they'd lost their, you know, symbolic mother. And it was also significant that times were changing. Um, and part there is the Modernist Manifesto, which is mentioned in the pages that you're reading. Two consistent themes that you will see in modernist literature are alienation and exile. And I wrote many of the great modernist writers uh, were outsiders. They were Irish, which I get into in my other video, like Anglo-Irish is not quite English. Um, immigrants, expats like Henry James and T.S. Eliot, they were actually born on this side of the pond, though they you know, gravitated that direction. Uh, the sense of alienation, outcast status from the mainstream middle class, late Victorian British values, that those just didn't seem to fit anymore. We saw those being questioned, questioned in um, Stevenson and Wilde, but that's kind of come to a, a culmination at this point. And there's this kind of cultural chip on Britain's shoulder. What are the sources of anxiety? So Victoria died. Um, her son Edward was very charming but ineffective and also he wasn't on the throne for very long because of his well his mother was so old so he was already middle-aged when he became king and he liked to smoke cigars so his son George took over so there was just this constant wave of we had Victoria for a long time it's Edward it's George neither of them feel like home and World War One broke out we could spend hours talking about what caused that but instead we're just going to talk about the ramifications it had on the British the warfare certainly, you know, impacted society and, of course, the soldiers. That there's weapons of mass destruction, right? There's machine guns. There's new kinds of, and I'm not a weapons expert. You know, we moved on from cannons to, to bombs and <clears throat> poisonous gas and, you know, trench warfare and barbed wire. But it was just gruesome. Um, shell shock, meaning PTSD. People were becoming more aware of what that was doing to soldiers. 8% of the British population was killed or wounded. Psychology, <clears throat> pardon me. So Freud's, he, again, I said he published right after Stevenson's story. So his ideas were really omnipresent in Europe, but understanding and accepting that not all minds are normal and that not all identity, and that all identities are constructed, right? We talk about nature and nurture, so that we're beginning to understand that. Um, we're all counterfeiting fitting in a way, right? that we are performing in order to fit into society, and that's a big part of the proof rock poem. Science, increasing evidence of evolution, um, new ideas in physics, like the uncertainty principle, the idea that no matter how much we master mathematics, there's some things that are just cannot be precisely defined and pinpointed. Um, relativity, that you know, time in the universe, it's not qualitative, like you can't I could say this better in just a second. Um, so I lost my words there for a second, but I was trying to say that it's the idea that time and space are not absolute, which is hard to wrap your mind around. Um, religion, and this is not saying everyone was all of a sudden atheist. It was just the idea that the old views of religion and sticking precisely to the ideologies of the Church of England just didn't fit. And that's where we get Nietzsche's idea that God is dead, that this Victorian flat belief, um, one for all, did not fit anymore. And that was a source of anxiety. So moving forward, the war itself, England was in tremendous debt afterwards. And they're also trying to manage all these colonies and they'd once, you know, in the Victorian era, they were the richest country in the world and now they're struggling. The horror and personality of war, class dynamic shifting and that more of the lower classes were taking part in the war and that's something you know, we talked about, well, we talked about society concentrates on when it comes to the Vietnam War. And even, you know, I talked about my husband with the invasion in Iraq. Who serves and who's on the front lines is often affected by this class dynamic. And that was causing lots of tension and bitterness. Women were becoming empowered, which of course is a good thing. But when it's creating a ripple in the, you know, society, 
it's creating more angst and uncertainty. And then the post-war desolation, depression, there's so many people that were lost or dead or are impoverished or starving. This is often called the lost generation. I'm not going to read this poem out loud. You might be familiar with it, Dolce et Decorum Est by Wilfred Owens, who was a British soldier who actually died um, toward the end of the war. I think the last day, something tragic like that. But he wrote this in his 20s. And just the way that it describes warfare and to be in the middle of it is so jarring and the imagery is so intense, and I think it really captures um, both the horror of what was going on, but modernist literature and what it was trying to accomplish. The Butcher's Bill, if you just want to run your eyes over it, is just the loss of life, um, or the, 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 and it includes the wounded and the missing, that was the toll of this, you know, horrific global, global war. Changing assumptions. So there's an intense picture here of a police officer grabbing a, a suffragette's head and shoving her um, against um, a metal fence while arresting her. That, you know, women were beaten, force-fed if they tried to protest and not eat in prison um, for campaigning for women's right to vote and for, for more rights for women. The colonial empire slipping, slipping away. You'll see this in the maps and the pages in the book on modernism. Irish Rebellion, which is covered in the other videos, and the class struggles after the war. It's very clear people are dying for the revolutions, both in terms of the colonies and what's going on in Ireland, and that is all reflective in literally, literary and artistic, artistic modernism. So Ezra Pound, who is a pretty prolific um, modernist poet, said, make it new, make it different, make it difficult, that that was the mantra for the modernists. Make it difficult means that intellectual literature had to be different from that which pleased the masses. So um, in the Victorian era, the most celebrated authors were like Dickens, who certainly there's a lot of intellectual aspects to it, but it's um, very available to um, a general readership and you know popular ideas for the general readership. And this is saying, no, make it intellectual, make it intense, and if people do not have the education or capability to handle it, we're not going to water it down for them. Uh, bringing in ideas like anthropology, mythology, psychology, science, and all those anxieties to challenge the reader. And I'm sure you picked that up in Alfred J. Prufrock. And I used to teach um, The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot. And that'll, that'll rattle your head. Um, just how brilliant that man is and how much he's woven that into every line. Like just the footnotes are exhausting. This idea of stream of consciousness writing that later writers like the Beats, like Kerouac, would pick up on. But Virginia Woolf was the, the queen of this. We don't have time to read Mrs. Dalloway. If you ever get a chance, the way she floats into and out of different people's minds and their perceptions, and especially capturing what it's like to live with PTSD is just fantastic. Uh, the Armory Show was an international ex exhibition of modern art in 1913, and it had all these um, images available. Teddy Roosevelt, um, who's the president, you know, walked through, assessed it, and said, that's not art. Because it was different and it was challenging and it was not you know realism or perfection or idealism it was complicated and dark and symbolic and just to give you some examples here's some work by Matisse cubism of course came into play and then we go on to Picasso Dadaism um, strives to have no meaning and interpretations totally on the viewer and then surrealism I'm sure you think of um, Dali and this kind of dreamlike world, the symbolism, and Jackson Pollock was an American artist, but just this abstract nature that really flustered a lot of people. So with that being said, keep this in mind as you read. I can't wait to read your great posts. Um, I do want to take a look at Proofrock um, before I bid you farewell. So I have my book out. If you want to pause and grab yours, you are welcome to. Um, First thing I want to do is go to page 1322 and we're looking at the beginning of the love song of uh, J. Alfred Prufrock. And it's a call to the reader. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it. 
let us go and make our visit. And I think the description of London is just so fascinating. And I know so many of you commented on that in the Jekyll and Hyde as well. I love, um, it's a very famous image of the patient etherized upon a table. And I think it just really captures post-World War I London. And I don't want to say too much because I'm interested in your interpretations. But that's a section I would definitely consider as I would. Now they're diving, he's diving into the psychology of the narrator who is this kind of weakling, middle-aged, balding, self-conscious man who's never taken any chances and is kind of lost in this historic moment. Um, toward the bottom of 1323, I'm about line 37. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn black and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to my chin my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. So just that he's so aware of the profound issues going on in, in the country, in the world, in the universe, and then so caught up in his small little social anxieties of his appearance and about how others... Um, will interpret him and how he's frightened or too scared to act. And on 1324, I'm on line 75. I just want to take you to two more passages. And this is him with his, his love, his romantic interest. And the afternoon, the evening, sleep so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor, here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis. But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet. And here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. So he's thinking a lot about his own mortality, and he's still too afraid. I think, you know, bring the moment to its crisis can be interpreted as as kisser, as to consummate this, as to, or just to act in some profound way. And he talks about just like the silly ritualistic aspects of, of daily life. We, this was covered in importance of being earnest and is very Victorian, right? The attention paid to tea and cakes and ices and seating arrangements and dinner plans and how superficial and unimportant that all is. And then in the corner of the room, we've got, you know, the Grim Reaper <laughs> snickering that your, your, your time here is finite. Is this what you should be worrying about? And I'm looking at the end of the poem I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear, wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids sing, singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves, blown back with the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. So again, this contrast of the in internal, the external, the profound, the superficial, um, the inability to act. And I will let you think, what, I'm interested in what you think about this reference to kind of sirens and calling men into the sea and just so much going on in this poem. And I think it's so pr profound and so beautiful. So in dark, and challenging. So take your time with it. Contact me with questions and cheers to us all surviving another week of this online.